mixtapes of the veins of hip hop. That platform that Gangsta Grills was became like part of the marketing of an artist before the album comes out. You do a Gangsta Grills to create the hype, you know what I'm saying? You don't gotta dot your I's and cross your T's. Everybody wanted a Gangsta Grills. Like it was like, it was coveted. You know, I wanna be on the cover of this magazine. I wanna be on this TV show and I gotta have a Gangsta Grills. I took that formula and just, whoosh, you know, took it to new heights. The concept of the EP and the quote unquote, the mixtape and you know, where we are and today comes from what I was doing with Gangsta Grills. You know, that formula became the it formula. My name is Tyree Sinke Simmons, also known as DJ Drama, AKA Mr. Thanksgiving, AKA Barack Drama. Um, I feed the streets, also the CEO of Generation Now and the creator of Gangsta Grills mixtapes, arguably the most important and most influential mixtape series of all time. are just like, you know, becoming synonymous within the streets. It made the world pay attention. It made the industry pay attention. It made artists that I had looked up to since I was a kid pay attention, you know. I'll never forget the embrace that Busta Rhymes gave me when we first met and saluted me on just the movement, you know, early on and what, what I was doing with Gangsta Grills. And he was like, you know, I know who you are. It literally like, you know, it became the hottest thing in the streets. My mom and my dad lived in West Philly. I grew up at a time, very early on inception of hip hop. Around the time I was 13, 12, 13, I went to go see the movie Juice. You know, shot to Omar Epps, his character GQ, rest in peace to Tupac. From the beginning of the Juice, like when the credits come on and know the ledge is playing and then going in the queue, like, you know, with his turntable set and he goes on to, you know, make his demo tape and his scratches, shot to DJ Scratch on the scratches seeing the turntable as an instrument or, you know, watching him cut and scratch on the big screen, it was like, you know, it blew me away. It was it was fascinating. You know, that was that was like my first moment of really seeing DJ culture on a big screen. I was mesmerized. You know what I mean? Like it was like, that's what I wanna do. Going into ninth grade, you know, my my mom bought me a, a one turntable and a mixer. Hence, you know, my DJ career started. I would like save my lunch money, not eat lunch, and like go downtown and buy records early on. Around that time, I was also befriended by this group called The Square Roots. Uh, I was introduced to Quest Love, Black Thought, and rest in peace Malik B. You know, and I really, I really got to like watch these guys, quote unquote, really make it happen, like get a record deal and like, Watch them go from being local hometown, you know, rap stars to on Yo TV Raps and Rap City. And it was like, man, like, this can really happen. You can really do it. So I'm watching this happen at the same time that I'm finding this like fascination with mixtapes and mixtape DJs and mixtape culture. And I was always addicted to like, the new shit, you know, and being ahead of the curve and going to school and being like, you ain't got this, you know what I mean? And a lot of that came from mixtapes. It's so amazing to me when I think about today, even for myself and just like how many outlets or how many different directions or I could literally go forever and be engulfed in hip hop culture, whether it's on YouTube, you, you, it's endless, you know, but when it came to the mixtape, I mean, this is like, you know, this was the music that you weren't getting anywhere else. Like new and exclusive music and, you know, DJs are putting on records that we haven't heard before and there's freestyles. You know, it's just this era where it's like all these fascinating new MCs and, you know, new styles. And they were like larger than life superstars. You would go to the mixtape store in a sense of like how easy it is to go on a streaming platform right now and to just go to a playlist and like, 
figure out all these new artists that you may have heard of or have not heard of, you know what I mean? Like before the blogs, before the playlists, you know, that was our, that was the only outlet for you to get this new music, you know, and we would run those tapes into the ground. I remember my, my dad pushing me in a sense to go to a, to a HBCU. And a lot of that was just based upon the relationships. I mean, he told me, he talked about my father's history with SNCC and just, I grew up in like not crossing the picket line and going to a lot of like marches and rallies and, you know, being quite conscious. So coming from the background and those roots, I was able to later on then go into different directions and show love to artists that may have not been able to get that type of platform. Coming to ATL and going to a HBCU, in a lot of ways, I think, changed my path. I was very East Coast stubborn in a sense when, you know what I mean, before I came to Atlanta and like coming to Clark, it was like, being a DJ was the greatest thing ever for me. It was here you are in the South with, you know, kids from all over the country, from Florida, from New York, from Philly, from Cali, and everywhere had their music or their sound that they loved and wanted to be appeased by. So it was like, I would get to a party as a DJ and, you know, DC wanted to hear Go-Go or Florida wanted to hear their sound or, Cali wanted to hear West Coast, you know what I mean? So it was almost as like you had to have a set that was like all across the map. That definitely, definitely taught me to be well-rounded. You know, I'm so thankful for that. I was making my mixtapes and being on campus and it would spread around. It's almost like when you're, when you're in the history, when you're creating it at that moment, you don't understand that you're doing that, these, these connections that you make. I met DJ Sense, I met Don Cannon, I met Lake Show, all at school, you know, all on campus, all in the dorm, all on the on the promenade. Like these are my friends and my business partners 20 plus years later. You know, these are relationships that, you know, started from going to a HBCU, started from being at Clark Atlanta University. And, you know, I don't know if I would be here if, if it wasn't for them. At the time, I didn't have a, a South tape. I needed one, like it was Birthday Bash. Like it's the biggest event in Atlanta, you know, with artists, you know, during the summertime with the radio station. So I was just kind of trying to figure out a name. And, you know, I just was in my one bedroom apartment and playing with words and Gangsta Girls came up and Sense was like, yeah, that sounds cool. So, you know, in the early years of Gangsta Girls, it was literally a compilation like, any other mixtape series, you know, it was the hottest Southern songs out at the time. As I was paying attention to what was going on up north on the East Coast when it came to mixtapes and watching how you gotta have a host for your tape now. You can't just put a tape out, you gotta have somebody who has some notoriety talk on your tape. Little John worked at the radio station at the time, was becoming the king of crunk, you know, since actually introduced me to John. And I asked John if he would come host Gangsta Grills. Mind you, it wasn't, it was enough. I mean, you know, I was a young kid out of college who just created this mixtape series. And he said, yeah. And you know, he came to the crib in the fourth ward and hence where the, the Gangsta Grill drop started. When I graduated from school, I'll never forget one of the first phone calls I ever got randomly was Jason Jeter. And he called me and said, hey, I got your CD from the barbershop. I got this new artist. I would love to bring him through your crib and, and you know, do a freestyle for you. So I was like, all right, cool. You know, I had never gotten a call like this before. Like, thinking about it now, like of how many of these I get to the, today, you know, literally this was the first ever call I got and it was T.I. And I picked out a beat for him to rap on. And during the, you know, when he spit his freestyle at the very end, he said, I'm the king of the South. And I remember, you know, I told Sense, like, yo, this kid just said he's the king of the South. Like, he's crazy. 
Jeter, you know, maybe being from the East Coast, he was very tuned in to what I was doing. And Jeter was like, yo, how about we do a whole Gangsta Girls with just all tip and Grand Hustle? And I was like, bet, you know? It was something that I was almost like wanting to do, but not even having a way to do it. And Tip was literally the hottest thing in the streets at the time, you know? We did the first TI, PSC meets Gangsta Grills, where it was literally all one artist, one crew. That was the only place you were gonna get that music. It was something totally different. Coach K lived around the corner from us in the fourth ward. He started working with young Jeezy. Coach would bring Jeezy through, and that's literally how we met. Jeezy was like, yo, I don't know if you know, but your shit's hot in the streets. Like, you know, and I got this vision, you know, I wanna do a whole tape with you, you know? And I was like, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, let's do it, you know? This is the first time that I ever got paid to do a mixtape. Like, they gave, they literally gave me $1,000 to do The Streets Is Watching, our first tape. And you have to remember, like, bef at this time, Gangsta Grills as a brand was more known than Young Jeezy. We dropped that tape, and the rest is history. Trapper died, like, changed my life. And you know, my dreams of, of what I remember, what DJ Clue was is now coming true from, for me where everywhere I go, all I hear is my voice and my, my signature drop. I was on tour with T.I. as his DJ. He was on the phone with Wayne. And I asked Tip, yo, can I speak to him real quick? I was like, you know, we, we gotta get one in. And he was like, nah, we do, you know? And, I had been using Wayne's music from the Squad Up tapes on earlier versions of Gangsta Grills. He was doing his own mixtape, so he was definitely familiar. I just randomly, again, came up with the concept of dedication. Like, let's call it dedication. Not knowing how like, perfect of a title it was for this goat of an MC. I remember we met for the first time at Stankonia, it was, and I brought a bunch of like beat tapes over and you know, a bunch of instrumentals and what have you. And they drop it like this hot kid, like there's some real bars on here. You know what I mean? Like, this is, these are crucial bars. Around this time was a time when Canal Street and New York City were very um, important to the mixtape game. And it was literally about flooding Canal Street because if you flooded Canal Street, you never know where your tapes were gonna end up. And because of what Gangsta Grills was becoming and through that system, dedication flooded through there. It was another outlet for people who might not have been checking for Wayne to really start checking for Wayne. So between the Carter album and dedication, you know, this kid that we were all familiar with was now spitting like he was wanting to give Jay-Z a run for his money and everybody started to pay attention. So a year later, I run into Wayne again. I'm like, yo, you ready? Like, you wanna go again? And he's like, huh, tuh. When Dedication 2 came together and came out, it was like a flawless mixtape. I felt like I was so in my bag. I had created this, you know, this persona of DJ drama where I was talking on the tapes and I was talking shit and I was saying creative stuff that went with the songs and I was like, you know, I was just adding all these bells and whistles and the spice that I feel like didn't really exist before me. With Dedication 2, it was like all the pieces came together and it was like, it's an incredible mixtape. It's one that I argue to this day that's, you know, number one between that. There's Trap or Die and there's Dedication 2, we're arguably the best, you know, two gangster grills of all time. And, you know, me and Wayne, our history is, is very important to the mixtape game. The concept of the EP and the quote unquote, the mixtape and, you know, where we are and today are the last, like, I almost want to say last decade, you know, comes from, from what I was doing with, with Gangsta Girls and with mixtapes, you know? I mean, everybody, you know, that formula became the it formula. I never really had any hesitation or pushback 
from any labels personally when it came to mixtapes. You know, people might have saw mixtapes as a threat, you know, to their bottom line, you know, because it was this music that was given away or, you know, it wasn't on the album, you know what I'm saying? So I think that there were various departments within labels that weren't that excited about mixtapes. Definitely not the marketing departments or like, you know, the, the A&Rs or the people who deal with the DJs, you know, they were all gung ho, you know what I'm saying? But the legal side of things, they were like, this is this is not adding up. It's not making sense. Like these guys are, are stealing our music, you know? For me, it was like, I was always working directly with an artist or with a label, you know? So I never really felt any of that type of hesitation, you know what I mean? But um, yeah, we was it was definitely a climate that we were watching where it was like, yeah, I don't know if everybody feels like the mixtape DJ is the good guy. Like maybe it was hard for them to differentiate because I was like, yo, I'm one of the good guys. Like I'm I'm on your side, guys. I'm I'm helping you guys out, you know, to to sell more albums, you know. I've never done a tape that's not sanctioned, you know, me myself, but but yeah, this was a time and a climate where there were a lot of unsanctioned projects that were were coming out, you know, like I said, it literally, you know, was like the wild, wild west in a sense. Donald Cannon, known as DJ Cannon, and Tyree Simmons, known as DJ Drama, are accused of bootlegging thousands of CDs for sale on the internet. We were just back from Martin Luther King holiday. I had just got my record deal through Atlantic and Grand Hustle to do an album, a Gangsta Grills album, and I got a phone call, somebody tipped me off like, yo, the boy's coming down there, you know, just heads up. I went outside to go move my car, thinking, okay, they're, you know, they're coming over here for, for what? We'll see what happens. Next thing you know, as I'm outside, I just hear these fucking Tahoes come from around the corner, helicopters, you know, motherfuckers with M16s jumping out of cars and like rushing over to me. And the crazy part is I was super cool, calm and collective, you know, looking back on it, having an M16 pointed right at me from all angles, and told me to get on the ground. I did just that. Um, they took my ID and I hear them, you know, talking through their walkie talkies and saying, we got one of the perpetrators. They stood me up and they said, Tyree Simmons, you know, you're under arrest. Uh, for bootlegging and racketeering under the RICO law. They arrested me in Cannon, took us to Wright Street, and we went to jail, and I remember being in jail and people tapping me like, look, you're on the news. And I looked up and I was on the news and it was like, you know, local DJs arrested for bootlegging and racketeering. Uh, they raided the studio in conjunction with the RIAA. They confiscated 80,000 CDs. This was my first run in with the law. Like, you know, I'm looking like, what? Like, first off, I'm, I'm a college kid making mixtapes. Like, how am I being arrested under the RICO law? Like, that's the crime. You know what I mean? That's what they take down criminal organizations for. So the next day I got out and me talking to Tip on the phone, he, he tells me like, yo, check your bank account. Like, they got you for the RICO. And my bank account said 0.00. .00. They freezed all my bank accounts. To watch it go from six figures to zero was, you know, I, I thought it was over, you know what I mean? A movement had started literally overnight, like the free drama and canon movement. And, you know, I think because of our, our status and stature in the game, it was like, wait, what? They locked up drama? Like, nobody's safe, you know what I'm saying? Like. I was literally the top of the food chain, you know? And when it came to mixtapes and I was working directly with labels and artists and, you know, it was just like, it was a it was a day to game change, you know what I'm saying? The mixtape game was never the same since. I also got a call from Atlantic Records that were like, drum, like, when can we put your album out? This is the, you can't pay for this type of publicity. Like, how soon can you get us an album? And literally, put me in the history books, you know, faster than I was already gonna go, you know what I mean? And, you know, it was a trying time for a lot of things. There were other companies that were literally putting barcodes on mixtapes and putting them in Target and Best Buy, things of that nature. 
and none of those places got raided. Like, n no Target or Best Buy got ran up on with M16s pointed at them, you know? So it became a, a bigger conversation about, you know, the music industry and the type of company and the type of movement that I built that was kind of like left of the business. And people looked at it like it was, an, a, you know, an attack on how the business was ran and, you know, they wanted to dead that. And how do you dead it? Go after the biggest name in the mixtape game. I felt a lot of guilt in a lot of ways because I didn't want to watch a, a, a culture that I grew up on, you know, that I loved, you know, that I was trying to move forward, die on my shoulders. I didn't want to be the reasons that mixtapes didn't exist. And it also made me more famous than I, even, I ever was, you know. As crazy as it was, it was like, you know, I became a martyr, you know. Like I, like I say on the Outkast record on my album, like I took the fall for hip hop and I stand in front of you stronger than ever. It was, it was motivating in some ways too for me because I'm a student in the game, you know, I, I studied the greats and I felt like, okay, this is my first real test of adversity. Like, you know, you don't get to prove that you're one of those guys until you get knocked down and get back up. And it was just that. I've always worked well when my back was against the wall or through adversity, you know? I think that's a very strong point for me, thankfully. We started Generation Now. Generation Now was literally a mixtape series um, that I put out in 2004 because of artists like Kanye West. He was hosting a mixtape of mine in 2004 and it didn't fit the Gangsta Grills at that time and I needed a new title. We came up with Generation Now and you know, we revisited years later when we wanted to start the label. But yeah, we, you know, we, we made the right moves. We came together into the new direction and, and the new spaces that I was, you know, uh, going towards. Even with artists like Uzi and with artists like Jack, you know, which are kind of, you know, people didn't see coming or, or against the grain. The future for us is to keep going. I see Jack really being like one of the biggest superstars on the planet, you know, in the next few years. Uzi has still some incredible music to make. You know, we have new artists that we've signed that, you know, we want to make superstars. You know, taking our venture in other directions and, and getting into film and, you know, uh, different fields of, you know, doors that are opening up. But, you know, again, at the end of the day, for me, it's, you know, it all comes back to the music. You know, it all comes back to, me being a platform or me being an outlet for people to hear some new shit, you know? So the beginning of my career is still the same of where I'm at now with like introducing an artist to the game that I can go and be like, remember I told you. I wanna keep being able to say, I told you, I told you. I love the culture, like I love hip hop, you know, it's, you know, I, when I sit in my beautiful home or when I'm on tour with Jeezy and Gucci and Ross and I'm watching Jeezy perform these records that he brought to me in the fourth ward in front of 15,000 people 20 years later sing word for word. But when I travel, you know, the country and the globe, and people stop me and say I'm their soundtrack or when Tyler, the creator, you know, one of the most innovative artists in the game comes to me because it was a dream of his as, as a kid to have a gangster grills. It's like, it's like an ocean to me and I'm a surfer and I navigate through waves. I don't let it age me, you know, it keeps us youthful forever if you allow it to.